everyone. Welcome to Moving Beyond Listening and BMB Education. I will be your session chair today. My name is Rachel Simmons, and we have a really interesting panel set up. Uh, so our first speaker will be Shraddha Naya. Uh, she is a postdoctoral fellow in the animation lab, and she has a PhD in pharmacology and toxicology from the Medical College of Wisconsin. And uh, prior to her postdoc, she was freelancing as a biomedical illustrator. Uh, make sure to check out the very cool illustrations and animations on her website. Our uh, second speaker will be Rebecca L. Rostin. Uh, she is an associate professor of biochemistry at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She received her PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology in 2009 from UC Davis. Uh, I personally look forward to hearing about her 3D models and seeing some of them in action. Uh, I will be the next speaker. I am an associate professor at National University. I did a PhD in genetics at UC Davis. I teach biology, genetics, molecular biology, and bioinformatics. And my current research emphasizes biology education, including NSF, HSI, and HHMI Inclusive Excellence Grants. Our fourth speaker will be Dr. Pete Nelson. He received a master's degree in physics from Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand in 1990 and a PhD in 1998 from MIT. Uh, Pete held a postdoctoral position in physical chemistry and uh, began teaching undergraduate physics, biophysics, and physiological modeling. Since then, he's been, developed, uh, been developing guided inquiry teaching materials with NSF support. He's interested in curricular reform for the quantitative life sciences and developing introductory scientific computing course materials. Check out the link to his book, Biophysics and Physiological Modeling, in his profile. Our last speaker, but Definitely not least is Pia Gordon. She is a senior at Kennesaw State University majoring in biology. Her time in KSU's brain lab was spent investigating how students analyze different modeling assignments in biochemistry and general chemistry classes. Let's give Pia a warm welcome. So our first speaker, Shraddha, would you like to take it away? Sure, thanks for that, Rachel. Um, hello, everyone. I am uh, Shraddha Nayak, a postdoctoral fellow working in the animation lab headed by Janet Iwasa over at the University of Utah in the very beautiful Salt Lake City. Today, I'm going to talk to you about a portion of my journey through one of my projects where I set to visualize metabolic flux. Seeing metabolic pathways can many times be overwhelming and non-engaging. And it's not just students, but scientists themselves have this kind of a reaction. So when biochemists, a biochemist in our department expressed how there was no intuitive way to visualize metabolic flux, we wondered if there was an intuitive way to look at flux and biochemical pathways in general. But what is metabolic flux? To those who need a quick refresher, metabolic flux is the passage of a metabolite through a pathway or a reaction system over time under a given condition. In this figure, you see how flux is represented in mammalian cells using arrows, and the arrow thickness indicates absolute magnitude of fluxes through a few pathways, which is normalized with a glucose uptake that you see on top here. Metabolic flux is studied by a subset of biochemists to trace metabolites through biochemical pathways in our bodies. And how they travel through these pathways can be altered during different conditions, especially during disease. It's such a dynamic concept that we thought we could use existing animation tools in our lab to convey flow of metabolites in a more intuitive way. And this was the result. The animation here shows carbon flux from glucose and glutamine from outside the cell through the central carbon pathways. It particularly shows how much goes in what direction. And you can also tell by the color that the darker shades of blue have more carbons in their structure than uh, the lighter shades of blue. 
So in this animation, each of these uh, particles or spheres uh, represents a metabolite. And the stream of metabolites you see is the flux value from a publication that I refer to. So this is uh, uh, data in form. After some discussions, um, we decided this was not really suitable for scientists at this stage, since as a scientist, you want to customize the pathways and uh, flux to your own research. So we thought this may be a useful tool for teaching the concept of flux to undergraduate students or trainees. And thus was born uh, the idea, the exciting journey of a metabolite. Uh, but a lesson is a whole new realm to venture into. So we decided to reach out to some educators. Janet was able to reach out to her Twitterverse and a three second GIF of an animation that I showed you earlier drew an incredibly overwhelming response on Twitter. This further motivated me to get, get it into a form that is useful for students. With many uh, fruitful discussions over many weeks from excited educators all over the US, including the very helpful and resourceful Rebecca Rostin, who will be speaking at this session as well, my initial lesson plan outline went from being an isolated one to one that can be integrated with uh, undergraduate instruction and complement biochemistry teaching. So this is how the, the e-lesson on metabolic flux looks. And the lesson consists of five sections. So in the first section, that is metabolites go on, journey, uh, on journeys, uh, we introduce the learner to the concept of metabolic flux. In the second section, metabolites go on specific journeys. You look at how, uh, flux through individual uh, biochemical pathways. In the third section, journeys are interconnected. You look at flux altogether with the path pathways all interlinked. And the fourth section, uh, journeys can change. You look at how flux changes with different conditions. And finally, the last section that's tracing journeys, uh, we look at uh, how flux is measured. So each section comes with instructions on how to use it, and also some questions to think about for further discussion and some resources for further exploration. So let's take a look at how each chapter looks. So this is the first chapter and it's an introduction to the concept and also conveys why flux is important. Similarities are drawn between biochemical flux and the fast moving and slow moving traffic on Google Maps, something that students are already familiar with and in fact, some educators already use. I'm gonna to skip to the next chapter now. Uh, in the second part, uh, students are introduced to a few key individual pathways like glycolysis, fermentation, TCA, malate aspartate shuttle, and uh, PPP. Here, students are also able to view points where high energy electrons are released and used up. And in a few cases, they'll also be able to see a zoomed version of the pathway. So let me show you some of those animations. So here, for example, we have glycolysis, and we can see how glucose is getting broken down into uh, these metabolites and eventually ends up in uh, pyruvate. And you can also see the high energy electrons located in the pathway. Now I'll show you a zoom version of this, which can also be seen by the students where I focus on a metabolite and you can see that the metabolite is represented in its uh, carbon structure. So here you, you have six carbons of uh, glucose, which is getting converted into uh, the other metabolites of glycolysis. And you can slowly see how it splits into the three carbon structure, ending up in two molecules of pyruvate. So I'll move on to the next chapter. So in the third section, we will see the central carbon metabolism pathways all integrated and interconnected. And we will allow students to compare between carbon flux from glucose and glutamine. So let's see how carbon flux from glutamine looks like. Okay, so here we have a carbon flux from glucose that's grayed out and flux from glutamine is in magenta. You can see that it gets converted to AKG or alpha ketoglutarate and it goes, majority of it goes into the TCA cycle and a small portion, roughly around 10% goes into formation of citrate that potentially goes into formation of acetyl-CoA and fatty acids. 
So once students grasp these ideas, some real life examples and scenarios can be presented by instructors that can reinforce pathway knowledge. For example, how do you think flux looks like when you eat a cheesy burger? So they can construct meaning out of what they see in these videos. Now I'll move on to the fourth chapter. So in the fourth section, we present two scenarios under which flux changes. One of them is flux under a different environmental state, such as hypoxia or high altitude. For the other, we bring in a disease angle and show how flux changes in cancer. And as an example, uh, today, I will show you how flux changes with cancer. So in this animation, you can see that flux under normal conditions is in blue. And then overlaid on it is the flux in magenta, which is that of during uh, cancer. So you can see a doubling uh, almost of flux, uh, almost 200% uh, that goes into glycolysis. And most of the pyruvate gets converted into uh, lactate, which is then excreted. So I'll stop that here now and I'll move on to the next chapter. So in, this, in the last portion, we will briefly describe how flux is measured experimentally. Here we have a tiny animation to show how one can trace label carbons from different sources. So I'll show you that animation right now. Just in the beginning here, you can see that glutamine is entering from the right side and it's represented in its five carbon structure. And we have labeled the third carbon. So you can see that with the glow and you'll be able to trace that glow through the pathways. All right, I will end that there. And with this, we have reached the end of the lesson. We have not released it yet. Uh, we will be first reaching out to uh, the educators for a final feedback and then releasing it very soon in the coming weeks. Uh, but after all this, is it going to be useful at all to the students? So to get an understanding of this, we have decided to test this. Uh, along with analytics on the website, we have decided to collaborate with a few undergrad educators to uh, conduct modest evaluations of this lesson. We are also aware that we could have incorporated simulation so students can play around with the input parameters and interact further with the visuals. We could also add in layers of information looking at enzymes, cofactors, points of regulation. So you might find some aspects missing, uh, which was beyond the scope of, us, of the study for now. But in conclusion, uh, I believe this uh, free virtual lesson could be a great addition to a biochemistry teacher's toolbox and could enhance student engagement and learning and access to an important topic that is not really covered in many undergraduate classes. And with that, uh, uh, this would have been really impossible without the help of Janet and the Animation Lab and all the educators and scientists who provided their thoughts, um, discuss these things with me and also, feel free to reach out if you have any feedback, suggestions, or if you want access to the lesson in future. And thank you so much. Well, thank you, Sharda. That was certainly entertaining. And oh my gosh, those animations are so fun to watch. Uh, we have one question that came in from Jennifer Lorichur. How do you plan to release it? Uh, how can it be found? And did you consider uh, putting it on course source? Yeah, those are, that's a great question. So uh, first of all, uh, once uh, everything looks good, we are going to release it on uh, Twitter. And we're also going to attach it to the Animation Lab website so you can access it from there. Uh, course source is a great idea, which uh, Rebecca herself and some educators uh, told me about. So I think once we have it evaluated, we'll probably um, have this uh, project go up there so um, educators can access it. And if you have any other suggestions, you can please, please feel free to write to me. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So I don't see any other questions for Sharada. Um, please feel free to reach out to her uh, as she suggested if you have more and are watching this uh, at a later date. Uh, our next speaker is Rebecca. So Rebecca, uh, take it away. Thank you so much. So today I'm gonna to tell you about something very, very simple. 
I teach a large biochemistry classroom. You can kind of see from the picture, even though it was a COVID picture, um, that's, that's a hall that's set up for a lot of students. Usually holds 170. And this is pretty typical for beginning biochemistry classrooms. Um, juniors level content rich biochemistry usually gets a lot of pe people in the room. And so uh, one of the biggest problems we face in that class is time. How do we do authentic teaching strategies with so little time? And I kept coming down to this basic principle that um, the less, spent, uh, less time I spent teaching them how to learn meant the more time they had to learn. And so with that, I'm going to tell you today about just one thing that we put in the classroom, which are 3D models. And we've known for a very, very long time that models are effective tools. In fact, I was delighted to learn when putting together this presentation that the first molecular models used in classrooms were actually used in the 1800s. There are old papers describing how to carve your own molecular models. There's, they're very cool. I didn't try them. Um, why, why are they so important? Why have we done this for so long? And, and the answers are very well researched. And it comes down to the fact that our ability to visualize space is different than our intelligence. And our, visual, uh, our ability to visualize space is linked to success. In fact, chemistry and by extension biochemistry has been described as simply a matter of understanding representations. Why? Because structure is function. And so we need to get students to understand those basic structures before they can understand their functions. Use of models can compensate for our lack of visualization ability coming in. But these images probably still look familiar. I learned biochemistry this way. I've taught biochemistry this way. I'm sure a lot of other people have too. Why? It turns out that's well researched too. Um, people research instructors all the time. And one of the things is simply that many instructors don't understand, understand how important spatial visualization is. So hopefully I've just solved that for everybody here. But the other problem is, is bigger, right? It, it's that it's more difficult. We don't have training in how to do this. Um, models are more difficult to uh, find and sometimes expensive. You have to require the students to buy them or you have to find a source of them. And then of course, integrating them into your course is not trivial either. And so what we did um, was we went out and got funding for exactly that for making instructors of large biochemistry classrooms, modules just like a textbook gives you, it has lessons, it has slides, it has um, the models, and then also the models are 3D printable so that you can have them printed locally. And then with the pandemic, we've also made virtual models. So all you have to do is that last part, the integration into your course. We based all of the model sets on misconceptions that we noticed in our students and that were um, also literature validated. So one of the biggest ones starts right at the beginning of teaching protein structure function. And that is the idea that phi and psi angles are really difficult to understand um, and probably not too important, which is what many undergraduate students get out of them. But in fact, phi and psi angles really underlie all protein structure, they're what make secondary structures possible. And so we made these very simple models where the rigid bond is, pe uh, sorry, the rigid peptide bond is separated from the alpha carbon and uh, different representations of four different amino acids. And what we asked students to do is make different peptides and measure uh, what sort of angles they would predict and then what sort of angles they can get. And we do this while constantly asking them to reference structures of chemistry so that they're working on those spatial visualization skills. We didn't stop there, of course, we kept building on that. So then we went through and we did uh, structures for authentic learning of protein structure, um, where they investigate mo folded molecules to help them understand how proteins are folded. We go to uh, all the way to enzymes, where we look at uh, allosteric, we kept having students think that um, allosteric was product inhibition. I don't know how often that pops up in your classes, but boy, is it annoying. And, and it all comes down to this big misconception, which is that instructors, we have really good mental models of all these ideas. 
but students rarely do. And the models are just a way to build them. So I'm not gonna tell you that it, it I'm not gonna tell you about this without telling you that it works very well. So I'd like to draw your attention here down to normalized learning gains. These are from pre post lessons. So in other words, we test with the same um, quiz before and after the lesson. These are no stakes quizzes, meaning the students are only doing well by the goodness of their hearts. They get participation points for them. So this is what happens in uh, classes with the lessons. And this is what happens in classes without the lessons. And then I'd really like to show you these. This is what happens when we look before and after the entire semester in classes with the lessons and in classes without. Not only are they learning more, but they are retaining more throughout the entire semester. So that's something that's really hard to achieve with any educational intervention. So we're very proud of that. We did not stop at protein structure function. We also went into DNA structure function. So these guys teach about DNA twist and writhe. Um, they're marked so that you can actually stretch them out and see that the spacing between the base pairs changes, which is one of the things that's really hard to do with the noodle models. They also have magnets so students can't put them together wrong. They can't match the wrong sides. Um, and then we wanted to show them just how much of a difference that hydroxyl group makes to DNA and RNA structure. So we've got a set on that. Here's a DNA double helix, which I'm sure everybody recognized. This is an RNA double helix, which I'm sure is not instantly recognizable. And that's the difference that that phosphate group makes. Excuse me, hydroxyl group, been a long day. Then we also did another module on interpreting DNA, how the proteins interact, because a lot of students think that all of the chemistry is happening with those AT pairs and the GC pairs, and there's nothing left on the side, when of course that's the opposite of the case. These also work. We also piloted them in small enrollment classes at a nearby college. One of the more important things that I'd like to point out to you is actually that students really like them. So here we've colored in red. I know, I'm sorry, there are school colors. Um, when students like the modules. And so here in A, they're responding to the physical models making it easier to learn the material. And here in D, they'd recommend that the next year's class uses them. So this is an overwhelming response for the first year that we used these modules. It actually went up afterwards. Uh, you can have all of these. You can have anything you want from these. Please take them, please use them. Um, if you would like the assessments though, you are welcome to them, but you will have to email me. Uh, you can also find my email online easily, so it's, it's not an issue if you don't grab it here, but uh, we don't want the answers shared widely, so that's why. Um, and of course, our lessons may not be a perfect fit for your class, and, and we definitely understand that. So if you are one of those rare gems of an individual that wants to move this forward, we did make a tutorial for how to make your own models. And if you wanted to modify those, we'd be happy to do that. Um, we'd be happy to uh, work with you to give you the Qualtrics stuff that we're using um, behind the scenes to make the student lessons. So yes, there was a global pandemic. And while I had hoped to talk to all of you in person and hand out physical models, that's just not possible now. Um, and so we worked uh, really hard over the summer of 2020 to virtualize our models. And so um, I have those gifts for you, but I also wanted to briefly show you what that looks like. Again, with the principle that these are easier to learn if you don't have to do anything, you can't do anything with this. You can't change the colors, you can't do, you can't localize, you know, you can't click on different residues and have them do something different. You also can't break it. You can use it from a phone. You can use it from a tablet. You can use it from any device you want. And you can rotate it. And you can do everything with this virtual model that we could do with the physical models with a few exceptions. For those exceptions, like Shredda, we did animations. So this is our animation um, asking students to predict whether or not a water molecule can fit into a helix. We then, of course, show them in a uh, we ask them to predict and show them with the space filling version of the same helix that no, that uh, that water molecule is never going to go into the helix. So 
So I hope I have left you with some food for thought. There is a caveat associated with using virtual models, and that is that currently in the literature, we understand that any sort of interactive visualization that's actually displayed in 2D does rely on our abilities to visualize that we already have. We don't know if it's the Zoom world that everybody's been embedded in for the recent <laughs> history, or if it's Hollywood and people's experiences interpreting things on their screens, but we did test what happened in that environment and we got very similar results. So we'd really like to move further and test that because we don't understand if this is uh, still relevant with this system. So with that, um, we have a wonderful team of people here. This was not me by myself. Thank you so much to everybody and to the NSF and my university for supporting it heavily. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Rebecca. These uh, certainly look like fun, fun, I don't want to say toys, but I will say toys. They look like fun toys to play with. Everybody has that reaction. <laughs> so um, you said that you've been uh, testing out the uh, difference between using a physical model and the virtualization. Um, could you talk a little bit more about any preliminary results you've got there? Oh, I'd love to. Um, so to our surprise, it was actually much easier to communicate function using simulations or sorry, visualizations um, and animations than it was using the models themselves. No matter how many times we told somebody that the, the white model um, existed in a protein or sorry, existed in a, a lipid membrane, uh, people just didn't get it. When we showed them an animation of it existing in a lipid membrane, nobody had any further questions. And so the gains, when we started talking about function and which amino acids would be likely to be in those sections were higher with the virtual system. They were a little bit lower for things like space and particularly for flexibility, which with a physical model, we can do this. And with a virtual model, they had to we watch an animation of, of this happening. That's fascinating. Um, I never would have predicted that. Us either. Luckily, there's tests. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, are there any other questions? Um, maybe one of the panelists has a question for Rebecca. All righty. Um, well, uh, let's move on to our third presentation, and that would be me. Um, so I uh, was using uh, uh, problem-solving surveys to try to analyze student cognition. So. Um, as I mentioned, I'm at National University, and it's important to have a little bit of context for this particular study. National University is a private nonprofit university with highly accelerated courses. Students only take one course at a time, but those courses are only one or two months tops. Um, if it's an in-person class, we're uh, cramming 45 contact hours into a single month. Um, that being said, uh, the majority of our classes are online. Uh, we are a non-traditional university before non-traditional was even a word. Uh, it, uh, National University is veteran founded, uh, is an HSI and has a deep commitment to non-traditional students. It was created by a veteran for veterans and even active duty military. We have a very diverse student body. The average age is about 32. Uh, it's about 28% Hispanic, 10% African American, and 10% uh, Asian. And English is not the primary language for 10% of our students. Um, all of our students have extremely busy schedules. They are exceptionally good at time management. Most of our students work full time the average student has one or more children 
and they do this while taking classes. Uh, as I mentioned, we also have many active duty military who are taking classes sometimes while deployed. So um, non-traditional students sometimes lend themselves to non-traditional studies. Uh, the gold standard for looking at problem solving is usually a think aloud study. Uh, think aloud studies uh, are when uh, someone who is trained in this particular method will present a student with a problem and then continuously prompt them to just stream of consciousness everything they are thinking and feeling while they attempt to solve the problem. Uh, these may require transcription services. They're not impossible to conduct online. I have seen studies doing this via Zoom but they're more difficult to conduct online. And the big kicker is it really depends on students committing to the necessary time to volunteer. And as I mentioned, we have very busy students. We've tried to get students to participate in Think Aloud studies. They don't have time, they're not interested, it doesn't work. So our question was, can Think Aloud information be obtained from surveys instead? Uh, our students are very familiar with online surveys. They get one at the end of every course, uh, minimum. Uh, so we created a survey in Google Forms. We asked students to solve a novel genetics problem with a fictitious heritable disease. And then we asked students to share their thought process and feelings. Uh, one thing we learned from a pilot study is putting a minimum character count on their responses was absolutely essential or you would get one word answers. Uh, at, at the end of the survey, we requested some basic demographic uh, information as well. So the fictitious heritable disease that I chose was actually from Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. So when students tried to Google the answer, they just got the TV show uh, and were not actually able to Google the answer that easily. So um, my colleagues and I are actually fairly new to qualitative data. So this ended up being a very iterative process. Uh, we developed an initial coding framework uh, that we started with an existing problem solving study. And from there, we uh, from there, we did a pilot survey. Uh, like I said, we got mostly one word answers uh, from that. Um, so we went back to the drawing board, created a new survey, added those character minimums. And once we've collected our data, we coded a sample set of that data. Um, when we coded that subsample of data, we then discussed intercoder discrepancies and discussed new themes that came about, revised the framework. We actually did this through three iterations before we came up with the final framework that we used to code everything. And after the final coding, everything, uh, anytime that we had discrepancies between all three coders, we uh, discussed them and decided them by consensus. So the survey was deployed in a lower division non-majors biology course and an upper division majors course. So the finalized framework, obviously we coded the answer itself, uh, whether it was correct or incorrect. Uh, we also had uh, for the problem solving itself, uh, were they able to, uh, were they able to describe uh, the relevant concepts? Uh, were they able to make connections between concepts? Uh, what sort of skill they demonstrated while they were uh, trying to solve the problem. 
And then for emotions, we uh, coded their emotional state, positive, negative, neutral, as well as their emotional, the, the cause of that emotion. Was it related to the problem, unrelated to the problem, or not specified? So the survey was deployed from 2018 to 2020 in selected classes um, as we were able to teach them. Uh, we offered it as extra credit after students had taken an exam on the material. And we ended up with 76 non-major students and 105 major students. Uh, overall, it was about 40% male and 55% female. And we did have to discard two answers as non-responsive. As you can see, uh, we ended up with a very uh, uh, wide range in ages as well. So uh, after performing a logistic re uh, regression, uh, uh, well, after performing AIC analysis to find the most important uh, factors, we performed a log logistic regression and it showed major concept and connection were significant uh, groupings for uh, this particular regression. After that, we did some post hoc done tests to see exactly how and why things were significant. And we found that biology majors answered correctly significantly more often than non majors. Uh, we found that uh, uh, students who were able to um, uh, correctly uh, describe a concept uh, were uh, much more likely to get the answer correct. And we found that students who were able to make a connection either explicitly or implicitly were better at uh, answering the question correctly than those who weren't able to make a connection whatsoever. So some common misconceptions that came up from this particular survey. Um, there are common genetics misconceptions all the way around. Uh, so the concept of blending rather than, you know, uh, inheritance by alleles, uh, the difference between carrier versus affected, affected was um, a bit of a vocabulary and a hindrance for some students. Um, the concept of whether this was an X-linked disease or whether this was an autosomal disease was confusing to some students. Uh, one other theme that came out is non-majors were more likely to guesstimate or guess a probability, and majors were more likely to attempt a calculation. So um, I love sharing excerpts from these because I think they really show the data uh, most uh, clearly. Um, we have uh, students who were absolutely on the ball to come up with a Mendelian recessive. It should have both uh, recessive alleles. Sometimes they mix up the terminology a little bit, but it's clear that they have the concepts behind it. Uh, my first response to the question above was going to be 50% because there's a really good chance. That was a non-majors response where, again, they're just sort of trying to you know, fuzzily guesstimate rather than calculate. Um, this one right here was actually from a major student who, again, they just had the misconception that this was X-linked. So uh, other insights that we got from the emotion category, even though emotions did not end up being significant um, in affecting an ability, uh, a student's ability to answer the question, correctly or not. We don't know if that's a limit of using the survey process or evidence that, you know, uh, stu our students are good at regulating their emotions. Uh, not all students did identify an emotion. Uh, and quite a few actually expressed fr frustration at meeting the minimum response length. Uh, a good example of that is also, I don't know what else you want me to say while explaining my answer because I already did that, so now you get filler words. Um, we, we get things like that. Uh, one thing that uh, surprised us 
uh, that we were uh, very grateful to learn about is uh, that other students express sadness or even empathy or anxiety for the hypothetical cu uh, couple or their child. Um, I began to wonder if this disease existed in real life, the kind of pain one has to go through, it would be a difficult experience with the entire family going through those pain and hallucinations with the unborn kids inheriting as well. This would be a sad and very difficult situation. Um, uh, I am slightly anxious because I am heterozygous for cystic fibrosis and so is the father of my child. My daughter has cystic fibrosis and she was the one in four chance. So again, these were unexpected results, um, but it's, it's good to, to keep in mind that, you know, you never know how some of these questions will affect students. Um, the one last thing uh, that came up is we did have one or two students who Googled this, found out it was from a fictitious TV show and were angry that it was a made up disease. So uh, some final conclusions. Uh, our students love the extra credit surveys. We had very high participation rates in deployed classes versus think alouds. Think alouds, we got zero volunteers. Uh, these surveys, we had somewhere between 60 to 90% participation depending on the course. Uh, another take home is be mindful of even hypothetical questions. They can surface unexpected anxiety and trauma in your students. Um, and finally, surveys offer breadth, but not depth. Our survey yielded some really interesting results, but being unable to prompt students for more detail in real time, like you would in a traditional think aloud, limited some of the information that we could gather per student. Um, so uh, with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, Michelle Browning and Nelson Altamirano from my university for helping us with qualitative coding, as well as the Dean of the College of Letters and Sciences for a Teaching Paris Fellowship to conduct this research. So if you'll bear with me a moment, uh, are there any questions about this particular research? May I ask a question? Of course. I was really curious with your short classes, um, it just seems like students must get exhausted by the end of the class. Do you, do you, did you ever test whether or not you had a difference if you put your survey in at the beginning versus the end or the middle of the class? Um, we did not actually test the timing of the survey, no. Um, our students do get exhausted by the end of uh, courses. That is absolutely true. Uh, that's an interesting thing we hadn't considered. Um, the reason we timed it the way we did was to try to make sure the material was at least somewhat fresh in their minds. But yeah, that's a great point. All right, uh, if there are no further questions, we will move on to our next speaker. Uh, so Pete, please feel free to take it away. Okay, so thank you everybody. Um, oh, I need to move my Zoom screen. Um, today I'm gonna to be talking about um, uh, a project I've been working on for a while, which is incorporating um, molecular biophysics into the undergraduate curriculum. Um, and it, it's mostly been aimed at um, the introductory physics class, because that's I'm a physics teacher, so that's where I can control it a little bit. Uh, and so what I'm going to talk about, and it's a fairly non-traditional approach, um, I start by making sure students can use Excel. 
then we talk about how to do um, algorithms. Um, and the, the idea behind the algorithms is just a way to communicate what happens in a spreadsheet. We're going to model change using finite difference methods, um, which can be used for just about any problem I can think of in physics. Uh, then doing model validation, doing curve fitting, and actually comparing the models with um, real data. Um, a major challenge that I took on was trying to come up with thermodynamic examples that life science students actually care about. Um, so osmosis and the chemical potential of water, ligand binding, uh, binding energies, and the Boltzmann factor, um, and then um, ion channels and the Nernst potential. And I, we probably won't have enough time to talk about it in any detail, but um, uh, the same techniques can be used to model uh, COVID-19 and the epidemiology of it. Um, so I'm going to switch over to my PDF program. And so here's a picture of a marble game. And it's uh, you might recognize some of the components. Uh, these are way boats. And we, uh, the idea is that students get the marbles to jump from one box to the other by rolling a 10-sided die. Um, it's, it simulates random jumps that are non-biased between the two uh, boxes. And um, the idea is that those random jumps actually simulate Brownian motion. And so I have a link here to a, a program that's just used as a teaching demonstration, uh, hopefully. Yeah, live, live going on the web. What happened? Uh, normally it doesn't take that. I, I tested it just before. Um, okay, I will <laughs> I'll come back to that. Um, hopefully my internet's still working. All right, so uh, go back to my... Okay, because um, <laughs> you can still hear me. Um, yeah, it's it's oh there we go. Let's try let's try that one more time. There we go. So it's a a, a three dimensional animation. It's a very nice environment. You can there are fifty molecules in the right hand box, and when you click on it, they start jiggling around randomly, and that simulates diffusion. And if you watch it for a long period of time, you know maybe this blue one, you can see that maybe it'll jump over here, and after another period of time, maybe it can jump back. And so that. The, the simulation of jumps is actually directly based on the idea of Brownian motion. Um, so what do the students do? Well, what the students do is they um, start at the very beginning with how you use Excel to do formulas and how you can make it count. And so what I wanted to do was just show you how that works. So hopefully this will work. I'm gonna <laughs> click on um, a spreadsheet. And um, that's not the spreadsheet. There's another one coming, hopefully. Oh, no, let me do this one more time. All right. Maybe. Uh, don't. Arr, grr, I did. Oh. Um, all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead. Um, and I'll come back if I have time. So the idea here is that the algorithms that they're doing um, have parameters, variables, um, step one, which is the first step of the, the spreadsheet, and then step one, which is the main algorithm step. Um, once they get the spreadsheet working, and I have another one that hopefully will work, um, they have, uh, uh, they model what's happening using what I call finite difference diagrams. They're really the same as most chemical ones, but they have the actual rates on here. So N1 is the number in box one, K is the jump rate constant, which is the same in both directions. So this is a, analogous to a, a, a reversible reaction. Anyway, so the arrow indicates jumping from that box to that one. And uh, this symbol here, the little delta just means a small change in the number in box one. Um, and the minus means that they're leaving, the plus means that they're entering. Um, and you can see from the colors how these go. Doing a little bit of algebra, you can actually come up with a, a compact finite difference equation that can be used in an Excel spreadsheet. And hopefully this one will load this time. Let's see. Okay, I think what I might have to do is shut Excel. Let me try one more time. If that doesn't work, I'll give up. Um, I 
let's see. Okay, yay. So here we have, have a spreadsheet and it actually includes the same thing that I was had shown you before. Um, so when I hit delete in a blank cell, the blue line that you can see changing is actually the simulation using the marble game approach to diffusion. And it's 50 marbles, so just exactly the same thing from the animation I showed you. And you can see that they jump around. The gray dotted line is the prediction for the ensemble average of what happens. Students can change all kinds of things. They actually develop the spreadsheet themselves. Um, it does take quite a while. Um, one of the things they can do, though, is actually change the number of uh, particles from I'm making it 10 times bigger. And you can see that the blue curve now is a lot smoother and showing larger systems are easier to predict. Um, which is kind of an important thing in statistical physics and biophysics, particularly of molecular level systems. Um, so that's, that's, that's my, my second one. So at least that worked. And you got the idea about how the spreadsheet works for dynamic things. Um, so that's, that's that. And then they can start doing that. One of the things using the same approach, I was developing some um, teaching materials. And this is a hypothesis, which is still uh, actually quite controversial, which is that osmosis is the diffusion of water. It turns out that biophysics people and physics people don't think it's diffusion. They think it's a hydrodynamic flow. Um, but here's a picture of an aquaporin chopped in half. And we've got kind of the, the selectivity part of the protein channel. Um, there's a single file of water molecules, which can be simplified like this. Um, and here I've just colored one of the water molecules yellow so you can see what the idea is. This guy comes in and by a diffusive process, the yellow one enters the selectivity filter and the one that was at the other end gets bumped out um, in a diffusive process. And they can then do one of these finite difference diagrams and analyze um, osmosis into a red blood cell, which is you know, one of biology's favorite examples of osmosis. And you can compare it with real data. In fact, this data um, uh, was part of the group that won the Nobel Prize for discovering the structure of aquaporins. Um, you can then add energy differences to the marble game. Um, and for osmosis, that energy difference can be represented by a volume times a pressure difference. So it's PV work, a good physics thing. And you can put that in and you can calculate a very simple energy factor. And when you put that in the model, you can actually derive from a kinetic model, the Van't Hoff equation for osmosis. Delta S here is the traditional thing that people usually use, which is the osmolarity difference. But the actual uh, mechanistic difference is actually what I call the effective concentration of water, the difference of that. Um, which is really related to the activity of water. All right, so other things, biophysical things, biochemical things, binding of a ligand. So I picked a very prototypical thing. Uh, this is meant to be an oxygen molecule binding to myoglobin. And um, the one thing that might be a little different from what you've seen is in biophysics, we like talking about single molecules. So this idea theta one is the occupancy of a single, um, myoglobin molecule and actually makes the, the mathematical treatment a lot simpler. So students can actually derive this Hill equation for the occupancy of a, of a myoglobin molecule as a function of concentration. And then what they can do is they can calculate a least squares fit actually by implementing the idea of um, this thing that I call the quality of fit, which is the sum of the squares of the residuals, which are the differences between observed and experiment. And I guess I'm going to try one more time for the Excel thing. Um, let's see if this one works. Yeah, no. That was the other one. Yay, so here it is. And um, uh, this is a, a, a spreadsheet that, again, students would put in and they actually calculate the Q from the sum of the squares of this column. Um, and you can use Excel Solver, which is under the Data tab, click on Solver, and find the minimum value of Q. So this is actually doing it live. And it should make this orange curve match the uh, blue curve as well as it can in a least squares way. So that's kind of uh, fun. And it, it gets students to actually work with numbers. And these are real numbers for actually horse myoglobin. Um, I should say equine, but anyway, 
uh, and now where are we back here uh, so you can also use exactly the same idea with the uh, occupancies and talk about enzyme kinetics so being a physicist I picked the one that's really obvious which is sucrase so I do little cartoons so I don't have to do in chemistry and it turns out Michaelis and Menton actually did pretty much the same enzy enzyme way back in 1913, and we can fit their data, which is kind of nice. Um, you can put in energies, and it gets a bit more complicated, but you can actually put in the binding energy using this idea of jumping between two energy levels. And when you do a nonlinear least squares fit for data collected at five temperatures, you can actually find the binding energy of um, oxygen to a myoglobin molecule, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, and then um, the last topic, which I think we're just about out of time, so I'll go through it pretty quick. You can do the same thing with uh, uh, membrane voltage and a um, ion channel. So here's an ion channel and a lipid bilane membrane. Um, the little purple circles are uh, potassium. They jump through through a similar mechanism to osmosis. Um, the one thing that's different is that the energy is stored electrically. So if you've got a um, potassium ion coming out of here, oops, coming out of here, it kind of wiggles around, but it gets attracted back to a, the counter ion it left behind. And so the membrane acts as a capacitor, which is kind of physics stuff. You can also do the action potential, right? Sodium and then potassium and then chloride. Um, and you can get to, from a teaching point of view, this is stuff that's expected in the introductory curriculum. And so we can actually use a biological example to motivate something that most people kind of learn after the fact is useful for biology. Um, and then this is my uh, COVID stuff, which I do not have time to talk about. So I will go back to my thing and finish the uh, summary, so guided inquiry, right? Students actually read materials, follow them. They learn how to read. Some of them don't like it, but I think it's worth it. They are actively involved, they're doing activities. Um, there's an emphasis on skills, learning how to do graphs and manipulate data and all of that. Um, they learn how to do finite difference models to model the rate of change. Um, we also attack um, thermodynamics, let's make it, thermodynamics from, kinetic models and kind of explain what thermodynamics is by giving them a concrete example. And so, you know, in this environment, students can discover for themselves that, that science is based on evidence because they check everything whenever we can by looking at real data. Um, and so with that, um, I'll just remind you where you can find the materials. I have a website, circle4.com slash biophysics, and there are links at the top of the page. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Pete. Uh, this is certainly interesting. Um, do you have any uh, sort of data on the efficacy of these approaches? Um, I, I did do some um, SALG surveys uh, quite a long time ago, and um, I was quite encouraged by them. Students actually, actually felt like they were doing research because they were working on developing models for themselves and then um, comparing them with data. And so they felt like they were actually doing the same process that scientists actually do in their research when they're doing modeling. Um, I'm actually looking for you know collaborators to do um, evaluation. It's, it's not really my thing. Um, I like coming up with stuff. I like working with students, developing new things. So um, I'm, I'm hoping it's good. There's a lot of new stuff with using Excel. Um, so the short answer is yes, some, but it was a while ago. And it was very encouraging, I thought. Education psychologists, take note. Yeah. Trying to make physics more interesting for folks who don't realize that it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Pete? All righty. Well, let's move on to our final speaker. Tia, please take it away. Hello. All right.
All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tia Gordon, and um, I am a senior at Kennesaw State University, um, graduating undergrad this this month. So um, during my time at Kennesaw State, as a beginning my freshman year, I have worked in the brain lab with Dr. Cortez and with Dr. Terrell with um, understanding modeling, virtual modeling activities. So what I'll be talking about today is a biochemistry course where students were um, using virtual modeling, um, analyzing an enzyme. So this is important for in biochemistry courses. So an application in today's world is understanding the coronavirus um, spike protein. And to be able to understand that you, Biochemists and um, scientists have looked at the interactions within the, the in, within the protein um, to understand um, different intermolecular forces that are occurring, and um, th that way we could be able to understand the function of the protein and create vaccine a vaccine for it. So that is an, that is why virtual modeling is important in biochemistry. So for this, for this study, the students were looking at prostaglandin H2 synthase. And uh, so that is an enzy enzyme that causes pain. And they were looking at non-covalent interactions that stabilized the structure. So they looked at the quaternary and the tertiary structure. So the quaternary structure um, would be understanding the the two subunits, the interactions between the two subunits and the tertiary structure will be understanding the, the interactions within one subunit. So we looked at how this information was processed by, so in the short-term memory, you have the, you have your um, processing occurring and, and then right here in the, so this is the parietal lobe and um, there's been um, a not so clear consensus as where this working memory is occurring. So it may be the parietal lobe here or maybe um, up here in the, in the cortex, in the frontal lobe. So what happens is the auditory and the visual, in the, in the um, visual processing comes together and gets integrated in the prefrontal cortex. And we measure the, this using an electroencephalogram cap, so EEG. And the, so we have a, our own hypothesized measurement, which is seen with the stars. So the, free front, the prefrontal and the parietal lobe. And um, the first measurement that ever came out, that was published was the Pope engagement index. So that is seen with the circles. And that mostly covers the parietal lobe. And then um, physics education came out with um, a measurement, published a measurement, and theirs was the incorporated the occipital in the frontal lobe because their activity focused on visualization. So they incorporated the visual processing. So we um, took, we used both, um, to come both uh, measurements to come up with ours. So ours, like I said, um, is the prefrontal be, since that's where integra integration occurs. And then the parietal lobe since that is for the most part where a lot of the working memory occurs. So we wanted to know which electro channels um, are the most appropriate measure, measurement of cognitive engagement. And um, how does the engagement change when you're looking at a quaternary and a tertiary structure? And these are the band, so this is, these are the ma mathematical equations that we use to come up with our numbers. And then we normalized it to, by taking this engagement index. So these, this incorporated beta, alpha, and theta waves, and then the normalization um, took the baseline with, by students looking at a white wall for 30 seconds. And we were able to, so that canceled out anything that they had going on um, before the activity. So that way we, our measurement would, um, 
norm so take the index and um, not incorporate what they were thinking about at their baseline. So in the study, this is what it looked like. And the so the students were using a program UCSF Chimera, and this was their second time using it. Um, they did the they did the activity independently. And so you can see here the student has the EEG cap on and um, they are looking at the program on a laptop. So our hypothesized engagement um, index show, showed to be favorable because we took the number of counts for each question um, that they had an engagement index higher than their baseline. So what we, what we thought was found that was really interesting was for every student, um, they, for our prefrontal and parietal that had the, um, the most number of counts, so 69 counts that were above the baseline compared to the others. And for, and within, throughout the activity at some point, um, they had uh, an engagement index higher than baseline for, um, for every question. So then um, this is, breaks down the quaternary st structure questions and the tertiary structure questions. So the, um, what we found with this is that if you look at the orange, so that's the frontal and the occipital measurement. So then what we found differently, which um, here is that the frontal and the occipital measurement was higher, had the highest, um, generally speaking, had the highest measurement. So um, normally above 1.5. So if you look at 1.5 at the average engagement index, the orange was um, relatively higher than others throughout the, the questions. And in the tertiary structure, it has um, more occurrences of being of having higher engagement index than looking at the quaternary structure which turned out to make sense because if you think about it, when you are looking at tertiary structure, the student had to dig within the subunit, deeper into the subunit um, while they were completing the activity, as opposed to the quaternary that you don't have to um, look as deep into the uh, enzyme as tertiary. So additional questions that arose were in next steps, was that so these are this is the brain topography for quaternary and tertiary structure and when looking at the tertiary structure uh, there so you can see here that there is a lot of activity um, that is shown in the temporal lobe so maybe we should incorporate the temporal lobe in a future engagement index measurement but also we thought about how um, in the instructions of the activity, students were asked to talk aloud um, while they were completing the activity. So maybe maybe that is interfering with their cognitive engagement or not, but so that will be a next step is to focus on the temporal lobe. So another thing is that the um, electroencephalogram cap, it captured, it had 16 channels. So it captured all the lobes of the Brain, not just the ones in our engagement measurement. So um, in conclusion, our hypothesized measurement produced the more counts of normalized indexes, indexes above the baseline, but also the frontal and occipital measurement, which was the physics education measurement, had the highest um, average of the three. When so, But the activity changed. So the brain activity um, in the particular lobes changes depends, depending on the task. And um, students' engagement increased when analyzing the tertiary structure, structure. So that led us to say that for, so we suggest for instructors that they um, take more, more detail in teaching tertiary structure because it can, it, it can, it, requi it has shown to require more cognitive engagement as compared to quaternary. So, and um, when talking about finding no non covalent interactions within them.
And then we would like to thank um, our NSF grant, Berla Carbon Scholars, and the LSAM program. Are there any questions? This is fantastic work, Tia. Uh, this is so interesting. Um, I'm curious, I have never worked with, uh, you know, a brain activity myself. Uh, why do you uh, blank against a wall rather than a blank computer screen? That's a good question. Mm, I mean, I don't, it can be it can be done. It's not um, that we avoided the, looking at the computer screen. It was just to um, make ensure that the student had the lowest um, that they weren't processing anything else besides you know whatever they were thinking about during that during that day. But other than that, so just to for our to produce a control. Excellent. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question for Tia? Well, all right. Uh, thank you so much, Tia. And thank you so much, everyone. Uh, this has been a really exciting session and I learned a lot and I hope you all did too. So that, that concludes our session for today. And we're right at one o'clock. Thank you. You all have a nice day. Thank you, you too. Great work, Tia. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Congrats on graduating. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks everyone.